Okay, great. Well, thank you everybody for coming. This is a wonderful uh, opportunity and I'm very honored to chair this panel on African Muslims in the Americas. This panel is most welcome as it advances our understanding of the long story of Africans in the Americas, beginning from the presence of enslaved Africans to the most recent dimensions of the presence of African Muslims in the Americas. So our first uh, panelist is Ganan Jai. Ganan Jai is a PhD candidate in social cultural anthropology at Boston University. His dissertation examines the public expressions of Muslim identity of Senegalese migrants in Brazil. Ghana's previous graduate training and academic interests include intercultural mediation, Francophone studies, transnational Islam, African languages, and Ajami military traditions of Muslim Africa. Our second panelist is Professor Kayla Rene Wheeler. Professor Wheeler is an assistant professor of gender and diversity studies at Xavier University. She earned her PhD in religious studies with concentration in Islam in, in America from the University of Iowa in, in 2017. She's an expert in contemporary Islam and black material culture. Currently, she is working on a book entitled Fashioning Black Islam, which provides a history of black Muslim fashion in the United States from 1930s to the, to the present time. She is the author of the Digital Humanities Project, Mapping Malcolm X's uh, Boston, which explores Malcolm X's life in Boston from the 1940s to the 1950s. Professor Weller is also a curator of the award-winning Black Islam Club. The third finalist is my friend and good colleague, uh, Professor Shea Anta Babu, whose work on Islam in Africa has been seminal and has taught us many lessons. Professor Shea Anta Babu is a historian of Islam and the modern West African Muslim diaspora. Uh, <clears throat> he teaches at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, educated at the University of Shea Ante Job and Michigan State University. Professor Babu is the author of Fighting the Great Jihad, Amadou Bamba and the founding of the Muridiya of Senegal. And he is the author of numerous articles that appeared in African Affairs, Journal of African History, International Journal of African Historical Sources, Journal of Religion in Africa, Africa Today, among other important scholarly publications. He has contributed chapters to five edited volumes on Sufi Islam, migration, Islamic education, Senegalese politics and the diaspora, and was an editor of the Journal of African History from 2011 to 2016. Professor Babu's current research, Making Muslim Space in the West, is a multi-sided project that explores strategies of placemaking among West African Muslim immigrants in Paris, New York, and selected cities in West Africa. So we are very uh, pleased to have such a distinguished panelist, and we'll give the floor to the first uh, Ganenjai to present his work. Uh, each panelist would have about 15 minutes so that we can have some time for the question and answer session. So, Ghana, you have the floor. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Ngong, for the introduction, and thank you for um, all those who are involved with the organization for inviting me. Um, I would like to start also by thanking um, the Senegalese community that is also helping me here do my research in Brazil. And I would like to um, 
begin by um, showing really um, support for a Senegalese brother who just passed away um, a few minutes ago before I joined here. Um, presenting my condolences to the Senegalese community uh, with whom I am working. Uh, to, to begin with, I'll just start with a story. Um, on, on February 4th, 2017, Tuani, a white 19 year old student, was in the Sao Paulo subway wearing a turban when a group of young black women approached her. In a Facebook post that later went viral, she wrote, I was in the subway and a group of black women, all of them beautiful, by the way, were looking at me funny, giving me the look at this, look at this white girl appropriating our culture type of look. One of them came up to me and said, Miss, excuse me, you can't wear this turban. Why, I asked. Because you are a white girl, she replied. I got angry immediately, but I took a deep breath. I took off my turban and said, see this here, this bald head, it's cancer, so I will wear what I want. The case sparked a huge controversy, of course, especially because Tuani had been diagnosed with leukemia a few weeks prior. The reaction ranged from utter disbelief, solidarity with Tuani or her confronters, to outright, outright racist statements, just as this one by a Global Extra reader who wrote, cultural appropriation, really? That's interesting. So from now on, Black people, meaning in Brazil, should be wearing Maasai's and Zulu's clothes. No underwear, no long pants, no skirts, no panties or bras. Tuani's case also sparked controversy because in her post, she made reference to a racist expression for which she apologized later in a global article. In the caption of the photo, she hashtagged, yes, everyone can wear a turban, by ter todo mundo de turban chisim, before adding, this is the most stylish black in white skinned woman, a negra mas branca, a negra branca mas chave. The expression negra branca or negra mas branca, the whitest black woman, is a linguistic acrobacy that a black skinned person who wishes to distance themselves from blackness or a person who claims to be a black soul in a white body, in between quotes, would resort to under the miscegenation ideology. The idea that the Brazilian people are racially mixed, um povo miscegena, um povo miscegenado, and that Brazilian culture is a product of the encounter of the three races as tres races, white, black, and indigenous, a symbiosis of European culture, mainly Portuguese, African and indigenous cultural elements has long been has long been a strongly held myth in Brazil, as illustrated in the work of Darcy Ribeiro. Deriving from this belief is the myth of racial democracy, which posits that because almost all Brazilians are, are racially mixed, there could be no racism in the country. This line of thinking was popularized by Columbia University trained anthropologist Gilberto Freire and it became a sort of national doctrine during the uh, military dictatorship years of 1964-1985. Scholars have demonstrated and documented racism and its specific working in everyday Brazilian life, especially, especially comparing race relations in Brazil to North American ones. I'm thinking here of the work of Hanshar, Hamilton, Jerry Davila, among others. There have also they have also pointed to what Rettner and Mitchell term Brazil's new racial uh, politics. That is a conception of race in Brazil that challenges the myth of racial democracy as a result of the glaring socioeconomic disparities between white and non-white Brazilians. In order to correct those socioeconomic and racial inequalities, what anthropologist Son Mitchell refers to as a constellation of inequalities, the socialist governments of President Lula and President Dilma Rousseff have taken a number of important measures. In August 2019, the government of Dilma passed Law 12711, also known as Lei de Cotas, making it mandatory for public higher education institutions uh, to reserve spots for students who graduated, who graduated from public high schools. Brazilian public university generally being the most pre prestigious they are sought after, making them extremely difficult to access for high schoolers 
who have not had the mentoring and resources available to those in private, private secondary um, school. The latter being frequented by adolescents from white families in, majority, in their majority. It is this problem of access that the lady quotas sought to correct by instituting the quotas for indigenous black, brown, poor, called Karenches uh, um, candidates in interest exam. And today it has been extended to refugees, to, 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 to people with um, non-gender normative um, orientations. In academia, many institutions have put in place verification committees, commission de identification that require potential candidates for admission via quotas to physically present themselves to a jury so that members can vet whether or not a candidate presents phenotypical features that allow them to be read, to be understood, to be seen as preto, black, pardo, uparda, brown, or mixed race, or indigenous. These commissions grew out of report of fraud, which some perpetrators have acknowledged uh, publicly. This had led to students being expelled or their degrees being revoked at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and at, at the University of Brasilia in 2020. In some cases, the, decisions, um, the decision of the verification committees is contested by candidates who take their claim to blackness at heart. A student named Victoria who succeeded a student named Victoria who succeeded at the entrance exam for the sociology program at the Federal University of Pernambuco in the north of the country via the quota scheme in the northeast of the country via the quota scheme saw her registration suspended because the verification committee deemed that she did not present the phenotypical traits of a black person. For as the notification email read, she had a pointy nose and mouth, nariz afilado, the boca afilada, as you can uh, see in the post, uh, in the screen capture of her post, on her Facebook post. It was in an attempt to avoid controversies that, such as this one, that in 2016, the Federal Institute for Education, Sciences and Technology of the state of Para, a vocational school, vocational school had, desi had decided to resort to what looked like 19th century race, race science. In the call for registration for the entrance exam, the, instance, the institute detailed the system of quotas. They also annexed a table explaining how they would ascertain that candidates who self-identified as black or brown were so. Candidate would face three committee members represented in the table as A1, A2, and A3, and the latter would assess the candidate based on um, nine phenotypical features listed on the table. So you see here, skin, nose, mouth, teeth, maxilla, skull, face, hair, beard, and zygomatic arms. Committee members would follow these steps. One, a candidate's skin color is first assessed. Two, if all three members agree that the candidate is correct in their declaration that their skin color is black, negro, or brown, pardon, all other, criterias, uh, all other criteria are disregarded and the candidate is reported as black or brown. If all three members agree that a candidate's skin color is white, items two to nine will be assessed. A candidate's self-declaration will be accepted if it meets the minimum of 6.5% of the compatibility criteria. Each item on the table is worth um, 12, from two to nine, of course, weights 2.5%. Without surprise, the call sparked a huge controversy also leading the Institute to modify the call, dropping, uh, dropping the annex. So how do Senegalese Muslim migrants deal with this complexity of, of Brazilian race relations? How are they making sense of all of this? And what are their relationship with uh, Afro-Brazilians in this context? In answering these questions, I want to highlight first, how the peculiar context of the arrival of these Muslim immigrants in Brazil has shifted concern from security to issues of racial and ethnic belonging. Since 9-11, the question of Muslims in the West has predominantly been framed around, question, uh, around terrorism, the compatibility uh, of Islam with liberal democracy, the supposed antagonism between Islamic culture with Western customs, etc., as many scholars have 
have agreed, uh, shown. I argue that the material concern over the commodification of black culture, to use Rosado's phrase, dominates in the case of Senegalese Muslim. I provided the case of Tuani, Victoria, and the Federal Institute in order to illustrate the varying degrees of policing of blackness. While institutions seek objective ways of objective between quotes, of course, ways of determining who is indigenous, preto, pardo, um, everyday definitions of blackness and dominant conceptions of Africanness highlight an aesthetic that is centered around Ropa African, the famous wax cloth, in particular, hay styles, uh, trans as Africanas, both of which are tied to economic activities dominated by African immigrants, especially Senegalese in this case. There is also the fact that blackness in Brazil is increasingly tied to traditional African religious uh, religions, such as Candomblé, Ubanda, and Batuque. In all these elements listed, seldom does Islam figure as a possible element of African identity. Of course, Islam has a long been part of Brazilian, uh, black Brazilian culture. The work of Jean Jose Reis on the slave revolt of 1835, led by enslaved Muslim um, called the Malays, as well as the work of Sylvian Diouf on the slave narratives are now classics that illustrate the presence of black Muslims actors in the early days of, Brazilian, of the Brazilian nation. More recently, Abib Akant and Jean, uh, among, uh, Jean, uh, Jean, Jean Carius, among others, have revisited this, this history. I am personally interested in the remaining of material culture of the, of the Malays, especially the manuscripts and, um, and the questions around their preservation and, and, and transmission of that kind of like exoteric knowledge. The absence of Islam as a constitutive element of Afro-Brazilian identity has to do, first of all, with the repression of enslaved Muslims after the, the revolt of 1835. Not only were Islamic practices and, Arabic and the Arabic language criminalized because of the manuscript found among the Malays, there were also deportations and assassinations which forced survivors to convert to Christianity or Candomblé. As, as historians, Rona Gaia, Alice Victoria, and Ariel Rocky uh, have shown in 2020 in their recent book. Today, the legacies of the Malays may be found in material culture and linguistic uh, influences. There is a second element that explains the sidelining of Islam in black Brazilian history, as um, uh, Ale Kali argues. In, post, in a post-19, uh, in a post-World War II and Cold Era, marked by rivalries between the so-called two blocs, Kwame Kruma is um, concerned with the Pan-Africanist movement, is credited with saying the following: We face neither East nor West, we face forward, uh, as Augustin cited. While this background helps to situate the statement in a specific political context, I have found the quote uh, cited by black Brazilians or black activists who argue that embracing Islam or Christianity is synonymous with cultural alienation. These activists also cite Molefi Kete Ashante, namely his book, Afrocentricity, a Theory of Social Change, which was translated to Brazilian Portuguese in 2014. The book is widely read and circulated among activists and has turned Afrocentricity into one of the most influential theories shaping current conceptions of blackness in Brazil. Afrocentricity International, the scholarly organization inspired by Ashanti's intellectual work, has a branch in Brazil. Black activist groups such as the Collective of Pan-Africanist Organization, UCPA, that you see here on, um, on the copy of the book, distribute the book and are major contributors of public debates about Afro-Brazilian culture. The following passages stand out in discussions of Asante's work. The I quote, the adoption of Islam is contrary to the diaspora Afrocentricity as Christianity has been. Turning one's head to Mecca is symbolic of the same cultural insistence which keep the convert looking in the direction of another's culture, not his own. The most crippling influence of Islam as well as Christianity for us may well be the adoption of non-African customs and behaviors, some of which are in direct contradiction with our, with our, with our traditional values, end quote. Today, closing advertis uh, advertisement telling Instagram users that, I quote, style is when you walk around showing off your African origin, 
end quote, or social media influencers warning that changing your hairstyle does not change your race, transition capillar now a transition racial, in reference to those who stop, in reference to those or who stop straightening their hair and adopt Afro looks, between quotes, to pass as, as black. There are, also, um, there are also offers of Afrocentricist yoga classes, which are called Kemetic Yoga, Afrocentricist English language classes, Aulas de Inglês Afrocentrado, Afrocentricist divination sessions, etc. For the same reason, and despite the historical and ongoing stigmatization of Afro-Brazilian religions, the latter have attracted many young Brazi Black Brazilians. Interest in Africa and Afro-Brazilian history is growing, though in part to Law 10, 690, uh, 639, signed in 23, that made mandatory the teaching of African and Afro-Brazilian history in, in the high school curricula. The growing interest in Africa and increasing number of Brazilian, um, Brazilian embracing Pan-Africanist ideas has created business opportunity for black immigrants and Afro-Brazilian culture brokers. This has made uh, Brazil a relatively hospitable place for West African. Many Afro-Brazilians show strong support for the struggle for regularization of undocumented African immigrants and in the fight against uh, xenophobia. The Senegalese Muslim response now. Writing about the difficulty a Turkish migrant face as they turn to Turkey from Germ they return to Turkey from Germany. Susan Rotman has argued that belonging is not a state that we achieve, but a struggle that we wage. It is a lifelong struggle to be a good person and to be accepted by others. In other words, to be ethical and to be recognized as 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 ethical. And good to successfully make community in Brazil, Senegalese migrants strive to be recognized as ethical subject. Proud Africans in the eyes of those who see Islam as fostering customs and behaviors that are in direct contradiction with traditional African values. For the Senegalese migrants selling turbans to white Brazilians, thus seen uh, by some as encouraging cultural appropriation, the logic of the market is not a justification. As you will see here, uh, uh, myself working um, with Senegalese street, um, itinerant vendors, uh, traders in, in, in Brasilia. In, the, in their everyday encounter with uh, black Brazilian activists and Afrocentricists, they have to negotiate the need to earn a living, show racial, um, show racial solidarity toward Afro-Brazilians while acting upon their own understanding of what cohabitation between people of different racial backgrounds might look like. Thank you that, for your attention. Thank you very much, Kana. That was a wonderful, insightful presentation. Uh, now the floor goes to uh, Professor Wheeler. Thank you so much for having me today. It's such an honor. Um, I usually only get to talk to other Americanists, so I'm excited to expand uh, my own vision of the world. So this presentation is coming from my forthcoming book, Chapter 3, which looks at um, Black American Muslims' relationship to um, West African textiles. So in this presentation, I'll focus on how Black American Muslim women in Imam Warifdin Mohammed's community use West African textiles, primarily Ankara. I argue that West African textiles serve as a site for inter-ethnic and diasporic dialogue over what it means to be a Black Muslim in the United States, through which claims of authority, authenticity, and Blackness are negotiated. I'll explore these complexities through providing two case studies based on my field work, which I conducted at the Seal Nectar Fashion Show in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, this year it was online, um, but I did it for two years prior to that, and the Malcolm Shabazz Harlem Market in New York City. So I will show how Black American Muslim women use West African textiles and clothing to challenge Arab centrism within American Islam, to challenge Eurocentric beauty norms and to create new routes of Islam that center West Africa. So I'm gonna begin this presentation with a brief overview of the nation of Islam from which the Imam Warfdin Muhammad community descends from. 
Then I will highlight the evolving beauty politics within the Nation of Islam under Elijah Muhammad and his son, W.D. Muhammad. Finally, I will highlight how Black American Muslims in the U.S. have incorporated African textiles into their sartorial repertoire by providing a description of the Seal Nectar Fashion Show and the Malcolm Shabazz Harlem Market. So the Nation of Islam was founded by Wallace Farad Muhammad on July 4th, 1930 in Detroit, Michigan. Many of his early followers were women who he met while selling raincoats and silks door to door. He told his potential customers that the silks he sold were the same kind that their people used to wear in their native country, where he had traveled from to share the capital T truth with his Negro brothers and sisters. He invited listeners to hear his message at a local meeting hall, and he often began his speeches by stating, my name is W.D. Farad, and I come from the holy city of Mecca. More about myself I will not tell you yet. The time has not yet come. I am your brother. You have not seen me in my rural robes. According to Farad Muhammad, Black people in the Americas, or Asiatic Blacks, as his members often identify themselves, were members of the lost tribe of Shabazz, whose unique Asiatic language, religion, and cultural practices were forgotten during enslavement. The Nation of Islam provided a remedy to this by teaching members about their ancestral past. They were the original people who ruled the world before being enslaved by white people. Farad Muhammad implored his listeners to denounce Christianity, a religion of spooks and spirits that had been forced upon them by their captors. God was not a spirit in the sky. He was on earth in the form of black men. Instead of quietly suffering on earth in the hopes of earning a higher position in heaven, Farad Muhammad told his followers to create their own heaven on earth through building a strong, independent Black community. Following Farad Muhammad's disappearance in 1933, Elijah Muhammad was appointed to um, be the leader of the organization. So women in the Nation of Islam played an active role in constructing their own um, identities. And so they sought to disrupt what Patricia Hill Collins calls the controlling narratives of Black womanhood, which has been used to justify Black women's marginalization. The three controlling narratives are Mammy, Jezebel, and Sapphire. Respectfully, respectively, these tropes can be described as the asexual caretaker who neglects her own children to take care of whites, a hypersexual man-eater whose animal-like urges masculinize her, and the Black matriarch who emasculates Black men. These narratives circulated in both the mainstream media and academia and have material consequences for Black women's well-being. In place of these stereotypes, the Nation of Islam positioned Black women as the original woman, the blueprint for all other women. The NOI provided Black women with the femininity and respectability that white supremacy had denied them. So according to NOI doctrine, not only have Black people forgotten their original language, religion, and history during the transatlantic slave trade, they had also forgotten the original structure of their societies and women's roles in it. The organization helped them recover their lost identities by providing them with new names, aesthetics, worldviews, and politics that distanced them from the racist images of rural poverty that followed many Black Southern migrants um, and Caribbean immigrants who accounted for most of the early Nation of Islam members. Women in the nation engage in the politics of respectability by focusing on proper grooming, cleanliness, and Victorian modesty, much like the Black Baptist church women that Evelyn Higginbotham Brooks studied. Dress played a central role in nation women's identity reclamation. So the nation women's dress practices made them stand out in urban areas, acting as a form of effective fashion. Women in the nation, especially those who wore the official Muslim girl training uniform, which you can see right here, temporarily transform public space into sacred space. Their presence changed their viewers' behavior. When women in the nation walked down the street, non-Muslim men stopped swearing and catcalling other women. Some even gave salams as a sign of respect. Modest dress communicated to people that the wearer was protected by the nation and its men, and if necessary, they were willing to defend um, their Muslim women against harassment. Many Black women were drawn to the nation because of how its female members were treated by Black men, both Muslim and non-Muslim alike. They believed by joining the nation, they would be protected from disrespect and attract righteous suitors who would be able to financially provide for them. 
and lead them to salvation by embracing the nation's teachings. It's important, it was important for the nation to have a unique aesthetic because it visually symbolized the power and strength of their community. Men wore sharp suits, while women's uniforms, women's official uniforms included a long high neck tunic with matching pants or an inkly skirt. This commitment to creating a unique aesthetic helped the Nation of Islam differentiate itself from other Black organizations, such as the Black Panther Party and SNCC. In addition to avoiding mainstream fashion trends, women in the nation were also discouraged from embracing Afrocentric styles, such as West African clothing and prints, as well as Afros that have become increasingly popular due to the rise in the Black Power movement in the 1960s. And so you see here cartoons um, that were published in Muhammad Speaks, which is was the official journal for the Nation of Islam. So right here, um, you see it says civilized, and you have people who are dressed in folks and turbans and fezes that you might associate with um, North Africa or the Middle East, as well as suits. And then you have uncivilized, which is supposed to I think this is supposed to be kind of African print, but you have Afros and bushy beards. So in 1968, Elijah Muhammad published an article in Muhammad Speaks entitled Warning to MGT and GC Class. In it, Muhammad reproached members who wore, quote, traditional styles and garments with gay colors. He wrote, no style of dress is to be worn, but the style of real Muslim people and the one that I am offering to you. The headpiece of traditional and tribal African people who are other than believers of Islam is forbidden for, for you to accept. If you are not satisfied with the styles I give you, then I am not satisfied with you being a follower. Elijah Muhammad's desire to differentiate members of the Nation of Islam also extended to hairstyles. He banned his members from wearing Afros in the, the mid-1960s, reversing an earlier um, declaration which encouraged members to wear Afros. Initially, the NOI celebrated the Afro as a means of embracing their original self, practicing thriftiness by not going to the salon, and engaging in healthy bodily practices by avoiding harmful chemical straighteners. However, by the mid-1960s, as the Black Power Movement was gain gaining steam, the NOI shifted its view, instead encouraging its members to use warm combs to straighten their hair, since relaxers remain prohibited. Straight hair was reimagined as a sign of neatness, beauty, and Black urbanity rather than Eurocentrism. And natural hair was reimagined as uncivilized, dirty, and unclean. So Sister Kathleen X affirmed Muhammad's declaration that Afros were only worn by, quote, native Bushmen and not contemporary Africans. She wrote, quote, of course, you do not find plastered down greasy coifs but you cannot say these hairstyles are towering flycatchers either. In civilized countries, the African appears to be intelligent and modest. His hair is neat and becoming. His dress is the costume of his homeland, end quote. This rejection of imagined West African aesthetics reflects the organization's larger anti-African sentiment, which specifically targeted indigenous African practices and beliefs as uncivilized and unnatural to black members. Black Americans. Members of the Nation of Islam were encouraged to take inspiration from Arab Muslims and East African Christians who were viewed as civilized. These anti-African sentiments reflect broader normative American cultural norms, which view the African continent and its inhabitants as pre-modern savages. They also reflect the Orientalism that dominated Black American religious life for much of the 20th century, which was influenced by Masons and Shriners. Historian Susan Nance argues that images of fezes, turbans, and pyramids dominated Black new religious communities because of the um, supposed positive stereotypes associated with North Africa and Islam. These oriental tropes focused on North Africa as the site of ancient knowledge, spiritual healing, and nobility. In creating alternative myths of Black Americanness that did not center the transatlantic slave trade, the Nation of Islam positioned Black people's ancestral homelands as Southwest Asia, West Africa, and North Africa, rather than West and Central Africa. So following the death of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in 1975, his son, Imam W.D. Muhammad, took over the nation and transitioned the organization towards Sunni Islam. Imam Muhammad retained his father's commitment to transnationalism 
but shifted his focus to West, Central, and East Africa. This geographical shift can be seen in the members' name change from Asiatic Blacks to Bilalians, in honor of Bilal ibn Rabah, one of the Prophet Muhammad's closest companions and the first Muazzin. Bilal was an Ethiopian who converted to Islam while enslaved and was manumitted by Abu Bakr, Muhammad's first successor. By focusing on Bilal, Imam Muhammad was making a historical connection to Black Africanists and Islam that could be traced back to the Prophet Islam, the Prophet Muhammad. He reworked Nation of Islam theology, but retained the idea that Black people were some of the original Muslims. This geographical shift towards the African continent and away from the Middle East and North Africa can also be seen through the organization's new dress practices. So um, Imam Muhammad relaxed the nation's dress code, encouraging women to move away from the standard Nation of Islam uniform. Female members created their own styles to reflect their commitment to embracing their West African and Central African roots and their experiences as African diasporans, as well as to resist calls from non-Black Muslims to conform to styles that were developed in the Middle East and North Africa. Through their dress practices, women in the Imam W. Dean Muhammad community built bridges with West African and Central, Central Africans and the larger African diaspora, situating the African continent as a central source of Muslimness. This bridge building can be observed at the Sealed Nectar Fashion Show in the Malcolm Shabazz Harlem Market. So in what time I have left, I'll just provide a brief overview of those two sites. So it's important to note that the Black Muslim engagement with African textiles largely began after the passage of the Hart Seller Act in 1965, which ended the United States immigration quota system that limited the number of immigrants from non-Western European countries. The passage of the law allowed for more Muslims from the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia to immigrate to the United States. As the racial and ethnic demographics of the American Ummah began to shift, hierarchies began to emerge within Muslim communities. Non-Black Arabs were placed at the top of the social hierarchy based on the belief that their geographic proximity to the Prophet Muhammad made their cultural practices of Islam more authentic. Arab Muslims began being appointed um, as leaders of masjids and Islamic organizations because they were viewed as better practicing Muslims who had not been negatively influenced by American cultural values. Many Black American Muslims began to embrace what anthropologist Suad Abdul Kabir calls pious respectability, in which non Arab Muslims shift spiritually, culturally, and sartorially towards the Middle East and North Africa, the perceived home of real Islam. Now, some Black Muslims, like members of the Imam Murfdin Muhammad community, resisted, resisted this Arab hegemony and sought to build stronger connections with Black Africans as one of their sources for authentic Islam. Engagement with African textiles from Muslim-majority Black African regions provided an alternative for Black American Muslims to reimagine what Islam can and should look like. So the Sealed Nectar Fashion Show, where these pictures are from, um, is over 30 years old. Since 2015, when the event acquired new organizations, the fashion show has had a different theme each year, which pushes designers to expand their perspective and aesthetics. The first theme for the newly emerged Sealed Nectar Fashion Show was Africa to New Africa, inspired by Imam Warfdin Mohammed. Um, the organizers invited three continental African designers and three Black American designers to participate. And the fashion show is an opportunity for Black women to experiment with different types of textiles and styles to produce something that is uniquely Black and American. It's also a space for Black women to negotiate what it means to be a Black Muslim woman in the United States. So these pictures are from the 2019 um, fashion show that was themed World Traveler, where organizers were encouraged to imagine what Black women's clothing would look like if they traveled to another country and were influenced by their host culture while still maintaining a unique Black American aesthetic. So two of the locations chosen for this were Ghana and Senegal. Each year, designers from um, the African continent have participated, usually from East Africa. These designers send models down the runway and sell products at the bazaar. The year I went, there were two, Rahima Shaban from Kenya and Asia 
Constantine from Tanzania. Their frequent inclusion in the show, show allows Black Americans to see the diversity in African fashions and to continue to build communities with new emerging, continue to build relationships with new emerging Black communities. So the embrace of African textiles by Black people in the U.S. is often is also a result of increased contact with African Muslims beginning in the 1980s, who introduced Black Americans to different theological practices and styles. And so you see this in many big cities like Atlanta and New York City. So the aesthetic influence is readily apparent at the Malcolm Shabazz Harlem Market, which is primarily operated by Senegalese, Ivorian, and Malian vendors who moved to the space in 1994 after the passage of no vending laws at the behest of brick and mortar store owners, many of whom were black American and saw African vendors as competition. The market is run by the black American lit mosque, Masjid Malcolm Shabazz. This operates as a third space where black identities are contested, negotiated and reimagined as well as the African continent in this space is made and remade. Patient Patrons can buy clothing, jewelry, textiles, drums, and statues, as well as get their hair braided. And clothing plays a central role in this. So many of the vendors are Muslim, and their presence in the market provides legitimacy to the merchandise, including clothing, making it a viable option for Black American Muslims. Zain Abdullah argues that some vendors, including Muslim vendors, wear African clothing to appear more authentic to their customers. However, I argue that these vendors wear such clothing um, because it is an African diasporic space and it's a way for them to create their own religious racial identities. So just to end, what I found most interesting about my research was that Black American Muslims did not really seem to care whether their textiles were authentic, um, so like hand woven and dyed, or whether they were cheap imitations, which are often oil-based, made from polyester in large factories and much cheaper. For Black Americans, it doesn't seem to matter where the fabric was from, as long as it's perceived to be from Africa. The Africanness of the fabric comes from the ethnicity of the vendor or the designer, the location of the textiles, where they're being sold or presented, and um, the other items that fit with the Black Americans' imagination of Africa. So this relationship to an imagined Africa and African material culture is something that comes out of Afrocentricity. And while it might give more space for reimagining Africa, it often leads to flattening um, African ethnicities and sartorial cultures. So regardless of that, for Black American Muslims who are trying to create an Islamic worldview that extends beyond the United States, West Africa provides another opportunity. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wheeler. That's a very uh, most informative uh, uh, discussion. Look forward to the conversation. Uh, uh, now the floor goes to uh, Professor Babu. You have the floor. I would like to begin by thanking uh, my colleague, Eric Schmidt and Falun Gong by organizing this meeting. And I would like to extend also my greeting to all my colleagues across continent who are virtually taking part uh, to the events. Now I'm trying to, I'm, I'm struggling with technology. I, I'm not that, many, that literate when it comes to technology. I'm just trying to find my screen here. I don't wanna share it because I'm just going to read my paper. Um, and uh, just figuring out how to get to it to the screen, my computer. Um, Don't worry, you can take your time. We're on the same boat. I am in yeah. the same situation. I think I'm, <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm getting there almost. Okay. Uh, almost. Just to bear with me. Um, oh. Yep. We're getting there. Um, Yes, so uh, the paper I'm presenting today is part of a book uh, that is due for release uh, in early April. And uh, in the book, I explore the experience of a community of Senegalese Muslim immigrants in cities in Africa, Europe, and North America 
focusing on the relationship between placemaking, religious identity, and the politics of belonging. The study is guided by several lines of inquiry. How do these immigrants make spaces where they can express their faith and identity? What are the inevitable compromises and concessions that these efforts entail? How are structures of power and authority within immigrant religious organizations affected by a variant diaspora? And how do home communities and diasporic communities influence each other's practices, identities, and aspirations? The Muni disciples that are object of this research from over 50% of the Senegalese diaspora, estimated between 1 million to 2 million. They are found in countries across Africa, especially West and Central Africa, but also in Europe and North America, and now increasingly in South America and Asia. What set this diaspora apart and really makes it a Murid diaspora is wherever they live, Murids always try to build a connection with Tuba, the holy city of the Murid in Senegal, where Sheikh Hamadou Bamba, the founder of the Murid order is buried, and where the leadership resides. Diasporic Murids are located simultaneously abroad and at home. And this double embeddedness is made possible by their ability, wherever they reside, to turn their living space into a place to express their faith and identity. But before getting to the core of my argument, that is how Murid immigrants in New York City make space for themselves, it is important to explain, to explain two key concepts that frame my analysis, namely space and place. My conception of space and place is informed by the work of cultural geographers, sociologists, historians, and specialists of religious studies who conceive of place as constructed reality. These scholars offer a heuristic definition of space and place that emphasizes the centrality of culture in the process of placemaking. While space is generally perceived as an abstract geometric entity, primarily defined by variables such as size, shape, area, direction, etc., place on the other hand appears as a site of accumulated biographical experiences. And I'm quoting here, a product of human agency. While space is detached from material form and cultural interpretation, Place, in contrast, draw its significance from infused meaning and value. It is the result of an agglomeration of meaning. In sum, it is the transformative power of people, practices, objects, and symbols that turn space into place. While the analytical distinction between space and place may not reflect the conscious intent of historical actors, it nevertheless reveals the tangible impact of people's culture on their living space in the diaspora. Murid disciple in New York City use a variety of instruments to etch their culture on the city's cultural landscape. Their effort to produce religiously meaningful places take different forms. It involves the physical occupation of space and the creation of Murid place by infusing New York's landscape with cultural and religious meanings. The production of Murid space is achieved through activities such as processions, lectures, the chanting of religious songs, the sharing of food, the display of iconographies, and the telling of sacred narrative. So in this presentation, I focus on two Murid space-making initiatives. <clears throat> First, the building of Murid houses in the, New, in the New York City area, and the celebration of Ahmadou Bamba Day that take place in Harlem every July 28th. The Murids established their first house of Ahmadou Bamba in New York in 1987. The house located on East 37th Street in Brooklyn had multiple functions that reflect the role of mosques and Islamic centers across America and the influence of American religious congregationists on Murid immigrants. It was a mosque, a living space, a community center, and a school. Today, there are over a dozen murid houses across the United States. Besides the few houses located in repurposed churches, such as the House of Detroit in Chicago, nothing externally distinguishes these houses from surrounding buildings. 
The interior, however, tells a different story. When one enters the house, the layout of the rooms, the furnishing, the decoration, and the behavior of the visitor clearly indicate the extraordinary nature of the place. Almost all murid houses open on a vestibule-like room, reminding one of the bar, typical of classical murid built space in the heartland of the Muride in Senegal. Murid effort to reproduce home country architectural design in American cities remind us of the continuing influence of the immigrants' home country on diasporic culture. The vestibule is the largest room in the house. It is furnished with oriental rugs and a few cutches, all arranged to leave space for copious sitting on the floor. For murids, walking barefoot and sitting on the floors are signs of modesty and humility, qualities that are highly valued by followers of Sufi Islam. The room serves multiple purposes. It becomes a mosque at prayer times, a meeting room, a dining room for communal meals, and the site where visiting murid sheikhs receive disciples. The decorations invariably consist of pictures of sacred murid sites, such as the Mosque of Tuba, the iconic picture of Ahmad Bamba, photograph of murid caliphs, and sometimes pictures of Muslim holy sites, such as the Kaaba and the Mosque of Medina. Along with the pictures, there are clocks and calendars illustrated with photos of murid sheikhs and bookshelves containing Qurans and volumes of Ahmad Bamba's writing kept sometimes in richly decorated leather pouches. These decorations and objects have a purpose. In their work on murid visual piety, Alan Roberts and Marie Newton Roberts demonstrate the centrality of sacred pictures and artifacts in the sanctification of murid space. Two other things define the murid house, the sound system and the kitchen. Sophisticated sound, sound mixing tables, amplifiers, speakers, and microphones now grace all murid houses in the diaspora. The sound system serves primarily to convey the chanting of Ahmadu Bamba's sacred poem in Arabic. All murid houses have, have one or more kurels. Kurels are just a band of young men uh, that specialize in singing Ahmadu Bamba's poetry and his devotional writing. Along with the musical paraphernalia, the kitchen is another feature of the murid house. The kitchen is not for cooking. It is primarily used to brew cafe tuba, the favorite drink of murids. Coffee is not grown in Senegal, but coffee tuba has become a trademark and sacred beverage for murids. Of all murid houses in the United States and arguably perhaps around the world, the house situated on 46 Angicomba Avenue in Harlem occupies a unique place. New York is the Western city where the presence of Murid culture in public space is the most conspicuous. The house was bought on the recommendation of Sheikh Murtada, the youngest son of Ahmadu Bamba, who was the envoy of the paramount leader of the Murid uh, organization or the Caliph to the diaspora. The Murid cleric wanted the place to serve as a mosque, a school, a guest house, and a space where disciples socialized. Like murid houses elsewhere in the diaspora, the murid saw the place as perfectly suited for a house dedicated to Ahmad Bamba. They learned from their African-American neighbors that the building was over 100 years old. It had always served the black community, first as a clinic, then as a shelter for homeless people of color, and later a health center. It is irrelevant for the murid whether the stories told about the history of the house are accurate or not. What is important is that this, those stories gave disciples the confidence that the house has always been devoted to serve a noble cause, the same cause it will continue to serve under murid ownership. The house is now undergoing a second renovation, the aim being to transform the building into a large mosque that can accommodate 700 worshippers and a school, keeping only an apartment for visiting murid dignitaries from Senegal. The addition of a minaret, one that replicates the large minaret of the Mosque of Tuba, a dome and an elevator is also planned. Beyond meeting the need of a growing Murid community, the ambitious renovation project revealed the Murid community's changing relationship with New York City. New York is no longer perceived as a place where one goes just to earn a living. The mentality of transient sojourners 
reluctant to plant root in the city that characterize early migrant has now given way to enthusiastic settlers eager to leave a permanent cultural imprimatur on the city's landscape. The planned minaret and the dome, in addition to the decoration intended for the mosque facade, are unmistakable symbols of Islamic and Murid identity. The celebration of Ahmadan Day, the celebration of Ahmadu Bamba Day, represent the same spirit that is uh, to turn Western secular space into Murid sacred space. Ahmadu Bamba Day came about through the meeting of two traditions. First, there is the tradition of American cities dedicating special day to iconic figures in recognition of their accomplishment. Second, for urban murids, the tradition of celebrating Ahmadu Bamba's memory in public space has long been a means of legitimizing their presence in the city. For the murid, the symbolic recognition conferred by the official proclamation of Ahmadu Bamba Day by mayors in over a half a dozen American cities was not enough. They wanted to give tangible significance to those days. And it is to this goal that Sheikh Ma Mormake, a grandson of Amadou Bamba, dedicated his tour of the United States, which take place annually from July 22nd to August 15th. The July 28th procession in Harlem marked the pinnacle of the tour. Marchers walk along Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard from West 116th Street to 163rd Fist West 150th Street. The itinerary for the march has changed over time. In the early years, Murid marches headed to Central Park where they held a rally. Now the march stopped at Adam Clayton Powell Jr. State Office Building in uh, Africa Square in, uh, on uh, 125th Street. The orientation of the processing itinerary toward the heart of Central Harlem could be understood as a reflection of the Murid's changing self-perception from undocumented interlopers to confident members of the citizenry of Harlem and America. This Murid procession attracts a crowd composed almost entirely of Black African immigrants. There are no floats, no marching band playing music, no grand marshal, and no button tolling girls. The marchers also dress also set them apart. The men wear brightly colored floral print Senegalese style robes and pant. The women who walk behind them are all clad in white. And as they walk, men and women perform dhikr or remembrance of God by declaiming the Islamic credo, La ilaha illallah. Some disciples chant Amadou Bamba's sacred poem with their natural voice or using megaphones. In her account of Pakistani Sufi processions across the cities in England, Prina Wabner suggests that the Chufi chant and zikr not only purify the martial's hearts and soul, but also sacralize the very earth, the building, the street, and neighborhood through which they march. This observation is also true for the Murids. Murid disciples believe that the coming of Sheikh Murtada in New York and their procession in the street of Harlem, chanting the sacred name of God, are a form of therapy. Murid sees direct connection between the healing power of their prayers and the improvement of the living condition of the black neighborhood since their settlement there in the late 1980s. Marchers often carry banners and pictures of Sheikh Hamadou Bamba and other Murid saints, including painting of Mam Jara Buso, the founder of the Murid Order's mother, conspicuously displayed by women marchers. The text of the placard displayed in the Amadou Bamba Day in July 20, 2018 clearly indicate the Murid's willingness to showcase their tribal identity as Blacks in the United States, as Muslim rooted in Senegalese Sufi tradition, and as American citizens aware of the nation's politics. The marchers' slogans are inspired by Quranic verses, Amadou Bamba's writing, and relevant to current events in the United States. In one procession, a placard displayed a quote from Amadou Bamba's verse, where he wrote, do not let my condition of a black man turn you away from my writings. Blackness is certainly not a sign of weakness of mine. Another read, Sheikh Amadou Bamba is an African Muslim leader of nonviolence, acknowledging the current political climate in the United States. And still another banner read, Islam condemned racism and tribalism. Murids have been successful in making their mark on the cultural and religious scene of American cities. They have done this not only through the occupation of space, 
but also through performance act that allowed the to convert ordinary secular space into extraordinary place even for one day now i'm going to stop here and i have a few uh, pictures to show if times allow uh, otherwise we can just go on with the q and a questions um thank you very very much uh, professor babu this is a wonderful uh, presentation we have some few questions here uh, the first one comes from um, emily riley and she is asking i would like to ask ghana about whether the question of islam and muslim identity was part of the debate about young women wearing the turban was the debate mostly about blackness or was it also about who can propose to be muslim in brazil Should I answer now? Yep, please. Okay. Well, hola, Emily. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, that case, the case of, of Twani, uh, kind of like triggered a large discussion about what constitutes black, you know, culture in Brazil, but it also sort of generated a discussion about what cult cultural appropriation means, um, what are the elements, for example, that black people also have appropriated from other cultures? Or what are the, 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 the elements that they have adopted from other cultures? And what are the ones that I just shared? Just because Muslims do your, use a, a turban, but some also um, non-Muslim do wear turbans, etc., etc. And in the case of Brazil, what people were saying is that, well, you think that this particular turban is an element of Afro-Brazilian culture, regardless of religion, but there are other people also who think that this is a, a religious item. This doesn't just have to do with culture in general, but it can also have a, a, a religious meaning. And of course, all those debates were interesting, but what I was mostly uh, paying attention to was the fact that this is an item that is, that is an item that, that's, that's an item that you will find in almost all the stuff that Senegal is, street vendors, for example, sell, those who is specialized, after, especially in clothing. And they would sell it to anybody, which means also that they are accused of, favor, of fostering uh, cultural um, appropriation. That so that's, that very, that's very, very interesting. And I, I want to follow up on that and ask, uh, uh, how about the sales of uh, images of uh, Muri Saints? Uh, like the images of uh, Sri Ntuba, Sri Ahmed Bamba, and uh, other uh, caliphs, including uh, one of the uh, only images that painted we have of Mamjara. How are those also uh, uh, reflected in the Brazilian uh, uh, Christ dominant, dominant Christian environment and in the market? How are they used in, uh, in these communities? How are the stories of these saints told? How are they used in the proselytizing uh, effort of these migrant uh, uh, Muslims? Yeah, um, in, in, in things that look very much like what Professor Babu has just described, it, like the, the Sheikh Ahmadou Baba Day, for example, in Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, Porto Alegre, which um, have the largest Senegalese communities, you the same thing, the same description would apply to the, the Kerserin Tuba, the house of Serin Tuba. And in those places, you find those, those portraits. But what is interesting is that people are sort of discovering, uh, you know, African, African Muslims, or they are at least discovering Sufism in the, you know, from, the, from, from the Senegal. So a lot of people are discovering that these are Muslims, and they are kind of surprised that there are Black Muslims. In Africa, which is sort of weird because of the history of Islam in, in Brazil itself. But the fact that also when, for example, they do zikr in, in, in the public, uh, in public spaces, people come up and ask, is this candomblé? Is this a traditional African religion? So the meaning also here, there is a kind of sort of a misreading or mishearing of, of, of what is happening. And of course, um, that mishearing itself tells you about what people want to hear, um, so sort of what they expect African identity to be, right? So for very few people really know about Bamba, of course, the Senegalese are trying to uh, kind of 
teach people about who Bamba is. When they have, for example, a Magal, they have conferences with something that they did not used to do, for example, when I started um, visiting in 2014, for example. But now the, 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 the kind of the academic conference has become part of, of, of the celebration of the Magal. It's, it's very fascinating to look at Pinal, to, to listen to your presentations, because they all re are reflecting different localizations of Islamic traditions in different parts of the Americas. So Brazil, the United States, and uh, other parts uh, of the Americas. So one element that keeps my attention is always how innovative these adaptations are. And this brings me to one question directly to Professor Babu as uh, just uh, to, to build on uh, the question that was asked to Ghana. I remember seeing in the, in the Murid's uh, events in uh, New York, they rented uh, Christian churches or synagogues to hold their events, <laughs> their, their religious events. So I'm wondering what is the, what was the rationale of that? Uh, and, and is that tradition continuing, although they now, you know, they have their own uh, space? Is, is the rental of Christian spaces still uh, uh, something important in the Murid tradition as they adjust to new environments? Thank you for your question, Falu. Uh, yes, it is indeed. It's still continuing. You know, the, the, the Murid Mosque is still in renovation. It's, it's not done yet. It's, it's a heavy, <laughs> expensive project. And in fact, they hold now their uh, uh, their event at a church. Okay. Uh, and, and what they do, they just mask the iconography, the Christian iconography, with <laughs> uh, sheets, and then they do their uh, their worship there. So, what is really interesting here is the return to ecumenism, uh, the kind of Abrahamic tradition, which I, I would like us to think more about. The drive of kind of moving beyond the kind of Judeo-Christian framework to an Abrahamic framework that is more capacious and can bring together all these uh, uh, kind of monotheistic thinking, thinking religion. In fact, that the argument that this is a, a place of God too. This is a place where uh, what was, what was, was, which was built for God. And there is an argument in the history of Islam to do that too. Uh, Caliph Umar played in a church uh, in Syria, but also in the Nativity Church in Jerusalem. And Muslim can make the argument that, in fact, Omar did not play in the church of the native in Jerusalem. He said, I am not going to play in this church because then you might claim it as part of the Muslim heritage. And I don't want that to happen. But in Syria, he did play in a church. And Muslim find it absolutely historically acceptable from the point of view of Sharia and fiqh to actually pray in, in a church. It's not a problem. So Murid actually are continuing to use this place of worship because what they really emphasize here is the idea of, of kind of belonging to the Abrahamic Brotherhood. Yeah. The idea of you all worshiping the same God. Well, you have controversies and problems yeah. because Muslims don't consider iconography something that could, yeah. should be part of worshiping the one God, but then mask it because the place itself really in its essence is dedicated to God. Yeah. And it's that's, that's absolutely very, all right yeah. to do. That, that, that's, very, yeah. that, that's very interesting because uh, it, it, it shows uh, the adaptation of Islam in the diaspora, because at home, for example, it would it, it would you would have probably different reactions that Murids say go to a, to, to the cathedral de Dakar and decide they're going to they're going to, they're going to pray there. And so uh, the issue here that I want to raise is how the diaspora is actually a fertile ground fertile ground for rest, really testing these theological uh, 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 dimensions of Islam. Right? Because they're no longer localized, they're now exposed to a global dimension, and therefore the experience that brought together Abrahamic tradition becomes something uh, as part of the arsenal of the tools as they adapt the new environment. So I think I think that's where I find really the innovative force of the diaspora, you know, in 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 um, adapting to different new ecologies. So I found this very very fascinating, and I think that offers actually hope uh, for the future. Uh, a hope that brings us together, that shows our commonalities rather than the, our differences. So that's a very good uh, uh, insight. Thank you very much. And I will have one question before I give, because uh, I have to go at some point, take my vaccination today. Uh, so I just want to ask my questions first before I turn the floor to uh, my colleagues. 
Uh, Professor Wheeler, you touched on a very interesting aspect of both the rejection and the challenges and appropriation of, uh, of Arab centricism and, and, and Eurocentricism uh, in the traditions of Islam, in the nation of Islam, right? And uh, it seems to me that the, 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 the old contention between those who regard Arabia as the center of Islam and every, every, everywhere else as periphery, right? And who elevate and treat Arabic as the only language of Islam and Arab, Arab culture as the only standard, right? Uh, challenged by others who say uh, we are Muslim, but we're Wolof. We're Muslim, but we're Persian. We're Muslim, but we're Turkish. And so I wonder how uh, early Muslims in, in America who were not member of the nation of Islam reacted to uh, these teachings of Elijah Muhammad? Um, so it depends on what ethnic group you're talking about. So before the Nation of Islam, there was the Moorish Science Temple of America. So there are a lot of different Black new religious movements that incorporated some versions of Islam. But there was also the Ahmadiyya movement um, who first came to New York City and specifically targeted white people for conversion, but found that Black Americans and Black Caribbeans were really attracted to the message, especially around like racial justice. So um, there are a number of examples of Arab and South Asian Muslims like sending letters to Elijah Muhammad and then being published in Muhammad Speaks where they're explaining that their theologies are wrong or sinful, um, that nobody is God other than God. So there was always kind of this engagement between um, primarily non-Black Muslims and Black Muslims in the nation about which theology was more correct. And what I thought was really interesting about Elijah Muhammad is he incorporated those critics into the nation. So they had Arabic teachers. They would have um, South Asians come in and lecture um, about what real Islam was and be a part of the Muhammad University of Islam. There were also Black Muslim groups who have always been Sunni, who have tried to distance themselves from the nation um, because they view some of the teachings as racist or like not Islamic. So especially around Yaqub's myth that white people are literally like genetically deformed mutants um, so there's always been some contention, but I think the nation provided a framework um, of nation building that other Black Muslims and African Muslims have been able to draw from. Uh, a follow-up question. Uh, how are uh, African uh, Muslim uh, female leaders, uh, such as Nana Asmau, have they had any influence on the, their dress code? particularly their dress code. Have their dress code being used in any way in, uh, in terms of fashion? I don't think it's specifically not an asthma, but um, definitely her teaching and learning circles are something that are really common in Black American Muslim communities. So women coming together and reading the Quran together in their homes. Um, there is a focus, I think, more on Khadijah. Um, just because of her relationship to the prophet, her age, being a successful businesswoman. Okay. And one last question before I uh, uh, read the, you know, the audience questions uh, to Professor Babu. So you mentioned on the spaces that they create in these houses of Saritoba, that the outside is not changed, it's not affected. So the changes are inside, right? Why is the, uh, the, the outside not changed? Is it because of local building regulations or is it, is it another reason? I don't think that maybe, well, context differ. And of course, the response to the context itself also differ. I think in France, uh, it's clear that Murid would like to uh, um, kind of let religion live in the domesticity because that's the politics of French secularism. Religion has to stay in the domesticity. It doesn't have a place in the public sphere. Okay. It does so in France. Everything in the is in the in, inside. I think in New York, the fact that you have now this project of rebuilding the house with a minaret and a dome, 
and decoration that actually uh, 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 will be done in the tradition of Muri of Muslim iconography tells you that the divide between internal and external is not is not that that okay. problematic. But certainly, you know, this is all about negotiating space. This is all about how do you insert yourself in a marketplace of ideas and culture and religion of people that to some extent, some of them are documented, some of them are undocumented, but they don't want to stir trouble. So how do you, how do you accommodate yourself in that context? I think one of way of doing it is this kind of dialectic between inside and outside, the inside being us, the outside being the other, a way of showing people that, hey, we actually accept your architecture. We can fit within your architecture. We can't, we don't trouble your culture. We just want to be part of it. We are not displacing culture. Mm -hmm. We yeah. actually want to be an addition to culture, That's to your okay. culture, rather than want somebody who erase your culture. Yeah. It's, it's really erasure and adding. I think adding, it's adding addition, rather than yeah. erasure. Yeah. And the way of adding without erasing is to have to control your inside and let the inside the way it is. That's nice. That's nice. Uh, we have here several questions, and one of them is uh, by uh, Ayala, and um, it is uh, said. Okay, this is the question. Uh, thanks for the talk. I have a question. Uh, it could be said that the Muslims have a deep influence about the tradition conservation in Africa, and uh, the person means that whether religion has Islamic faith have deeply influenced African traditions? I think that's a general question for every, for all the panelists. Uh, Ghana, why don't you start? Well, yeah, um, thank you. Um, that's a, a, a question I think that has been debated a, a lot recently, right? The, the Africanization of Islam, the Ajamization of Islam, or how, do Muslims in Africa sort of localize Islam? The, the, the reality is that Islam takes local texture wherever it goes. The essence, of course, or at least the core elements are going to, to be maintained. People are going to continue um, praying five times a day and they are going to be con to continue facing Mecca uh, when they pray, etc., etc. There are going to be small differences or at least significant, or sometimes significant differences as to how people practice the faith. But the core is going to remain, but people are always going to localize. One example that I think find fascinating is dress. Some people, for example, we, um, um, the, 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 the wrap, for example, what they call sir in Senegal. Men do not wear that to go to the mosque. But, for example, in Indonesia, that's perfectly normal. Those, those are men, men, men do wear wrap, for example. But, of course, that is supposed to be an item that allows you to, to dress appropriately for the for, for the prayer. And this is just one example, of course, of the localization of Islam. Good. Uh, 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 Professor Wheeler, Professor Babu. I, mean, I would say that Africa has a great influence on Islam. I would flip it just if we're thinking about historically, like who were some of the first Muslims, where the first Muslim um, migrant communities where it was in Ethiopia. So you see that influence, um, the rich history of intellectualism in the African continent. And that certainly has trickled in um, to the United States, both in the nation of Islam and in that Muhammad Mohammed communities in terms of who is considered like leading thinkers, but even down to dress practices. And there's a lot of borrowing, not just from West Africa and Central Africa, but all over the continent, places where African Americans likely never originated from in the first place. Uh, Professor, yes. Professor it's, an interesting, it's an interesting question, a big one, certainly, that yeah. <laughs> itself <laughs> can, can, can occupy us a, a whole day. Yeah. Well, the, the, the problem that the, this is the question actually I always raise in my classes. And, and first, just some facts um, Islam arrived in Africa eight years after the death of Prophet Muhammad. He passed away in 632, in 640 Muslim war in Cairo, what we call Cairo, to where we call Cairo today. Two centuries later, Islam was in Ghana, had become dominant there. Um, and before even that, in 624, Muhammad was still alive, but he sent twice refugees that were Muslim in Ethiopia for their protection. So then the idea is, can we really distinguish something that we can call Africa 
yeah. or African culture separate to something that is different that we can call Islam in the context of Africa? That's the question I always ask my students. And I like to tell them, how long does a culture live among you and shape you before it becomes really your culture? Yeah. <laughs> that's the problem. And that's yeah. the problem I have with Afrocentrism. Molefe yeah. Asante uh, that Ghana talk about, Ghana discussed. If you are in search of something that is pure Africa, completely separated from Islam and Christianity and other tradition, how far do you go? How deep do you do you dig to get it? Is it still there? Because what we call Africa, African culture today, is what Said said, hopelessly mixed <laughs> for, yeah. Thousands, yeah. for hundreds of years. Yeah. So you really cannot separate something that you might call Islam and something that you might call Africa. Yeah. And I, 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 I agree with that. Yep. Yeah. I think and, that's and, and, and the useful concept, analytical concept I, I, I like to use here, which I think is very helpful in, in dealing with these complex issues, uh, is Islam as a discursive tradition, yeah. uh, as developed by Tawal Assad. If we agree with Assad that Islam is a discursive tradition, then <clears throat> it is a tradition that is born of a dialogical relationship between communities, wherever they are, and what is considered the kind of core structure or tenet of Islam. Then Islam really is something that Muslims create continuously, yeah. wherever they are in a dialogue between the local culture and what is called the canonic, uh, the canon of Islam. So that what, as a historian and as social scientist, since we study people and their culture and their religion, then we cannot consider Islam as something that is completely separate from people's everyday life and history. Something that is left in a book there that never changed, as Orientalists would, would say. Yeah. Now, if we take that, 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 that kind of perspective, then, I don't see that the debate about what is Islam within Africa and what is not among African Muslim societies become moot. Yeah. And I, I would say, uh, just to build on that, I, I fully agree. And uh, we all have been dealing with that big question that was raised. And uh, I think that in our effort to really make sense of the interactions between Islamic traditions, and not only really Islamic tradition, but all the monotheist traditions with local traditions as they travel. I think that uh, uh, analytical tool uh, is important. And so we've tried to capture that um, uh, with the concept of Adamization, right? Well, because uh, the truth is the concept, and I could see where the the question was going, and this is always the question in anthropology, you have to go and try to find what is what is authentic. There's a good paper on how anthropology has avoided Islam in Africa, and then particularly because of this quest uh, for what is authentically African. But uh, the truth is that when the two cultures interact, it is not really a loss of, 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 of religion or, or a, a loss of value. It's actually creation of new values, right? And the way I like to uh, remember it is the metaphor that one of my colleagues reminded me not long ago of, of, of Amadou Ampateba. He said, wherever Islam is like a river and it takes the, the water, takes the color of the soil where it, where it goes through. <laughs> and so which means that it has to localize. And its localization does not mean that it loses uh, any value. It simply means it's enriched, actually. Uh, its its, it's, 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 it's uh, education tradition will, will be enriched by the local traditions. Its uh, architecture will be uh, Africanized. But there will also be innovations in one location that you won't find elsewhere. Right? And even the history of Islam itself, if you just look at the history of the Arabic language itself, it's the result of that kind of enrichment. Right? Because what we know as Arabic script today is actually an English form of Aramaic script. Okay, so where do you end? And and just to come to Professor Babu's question, where you know how far do you have to go <laughs> to go uh, before you can say I have found the what is authentically African? So I think it's better really to conceptualize Islam as as really a faith that is continually being enriched as it adapt, adjusts and adapts to new environments. So that's a, that's a good, but it's a big question that is still uh, being discussed. Another question here is uh, by Martin O'Quinn. 
Uh, he says, I'm wondering if you could talk about the difference you've observed in the course of your fieldwork between recent Senegalese migrants and those who have lived in Brazil for a while. How do migrant attitude toward Brazilian racial formation change over time as they adapt to life in Brazil? And how do more recent migrants navigate the process of finding a place for themselves amidst racial identities in Brazil? That, so that sounds to me the question goes to Ghana. Yeah. Um, thank you, Martin. Um, <laughs> that's a very interesting question. I, I think that the simple answer is um, Senegalese learn through trial and error. Um, one example, for example, is that one example is the case of um, a young Senegalese um, rapper who, you know, uh, like when he arrived two years later, he produced a song uh, called Minha Morena, My Morena, or My, My Brown Skin Girl. Of course, that's a reproduction of an ancient um, um, racial category that today most Brazil, black Brazilian would find offensive because morena is sort of, or, or parda is something that you would use, for example, for an animal, that, but you won't use that for a person. Even though the word parda is still being used in, in, in census, uh, in censuses, um, people don't want to, to use it for themselves because they find it insulting. So this young Senegalese start. Um, produce a song called Mina Morena, singing, uh, you know, the beauty of a young black woman, etc. And the controversy that it generated taught him, you know, really what it meant to say those words, because that was, he meant that he was aligning himself with, um, with, um, with, racist, uh, with racist Brazilian. And he was sort of trying to really praise a, a, black, a black woman. Many of them are just gonna learn that way, that you say something that you're not supposed to say and then you get lectured. Or you encounter somebody who really has a different understanding of what it means to be a black and going to certain places, doing, dealing with certain things or selling a turban, for example, to a white person. And then you get into a heated debate and you learn from that. And now I would say that most Senegalese are careful about this sort of the vocabulary they use. When they when they when they talk about um, racial categories in Brazil, and of course it's it's ongoing. It's a very young um, um, population coming, but it's also very re a recent migration. Uh, the most um, many most of the Senegalese in Brazil have come between 2010 and 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 and, and, and 2015, for example. That the largest numbers came between those in that period. Yeah. There are other um, waves of migrations in the 90s, but those are mostly uh, students who came to university, studied, and just understood really what it meant to be a black person in Brazil. And those are not encountering the kind of difficulties that the less um, educated in the French system, in the European system, uh, are, are encountering. Uh, there's another good question here for Professor uh, Wheeler. Uh, and the question is, uh, uh, did, did she encounter dis discussions or reactions from African Muslims to the fashion choices of African American Muslims? Not uh, in person, but online. And so I think that kind of points out that a lot of the debates, especially around cultural appropriation are generational. So I noticed in person older, African Muslim women were really excited to see um, anybody and everybody wearing something from their culture, but online younger African Muslims were very, very um, vocal about it being cultural appropriation, even from um, Black Americans. And part of that had to do with like uh, what text styles were being used. So like kente cloth, um, Often it's not supposed to be like an everyday textile <laughs> for really special occasions. And it had a lot to do with Black Americans not knowing the cultural significance of um, certain textiles or colors and treating um, Africa as a monolith. So assuming there's this one thing that means Africanness and it's dashikis or it's wax print. But I think it brings up to a very um, important conversation about like ownership and authorship, especially when you're talking about um, wax prints, um, because Ankara, it's a Dutch copy of Indonesian batiks that appropriates indigenous West African tie dye. 
um, designs and practices. So a lot of um, the wax prints you will buy in the Harlem market or even at some of the runway shows are made in the Netherlands by Blisco or all of these other big brands. So it's like, what makes this African in the yeah. first place? Um, and you're starting to see interesting conversations about that and the focus on more direct sourcing and making sure that if you're going to wear African clothes, whatever that is, actually support African communities on the African continent. That's great. Uh, is there another so question? The wax yep. in Brazil comes from China. That's mostly right, yeah. Now. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, and, and talking about China, we also have now, and this is the first time I have seen a new image of uh, Mamjara Busso, the mother of Serin Tuba, that I have never seen before, that has been produced for Chinese and Chinese exports. And so I was very shocked. And that means within this engagement with China, we also have marketing of religious artifacts that maybe did not exist that were imagined. <laughs> you know? So I think that's, that's very interesting. I don't know, have you seen that image of uh, uh, Mam Jara? That is different from the, you know, the standard one that we see her holding the fence. There's a new one, gray, where there's a woman. Uh, I've never seen that in my life. And uh, I have been told that the Chinese uh, have been mass producing them uh, and selling them. Have you seen them, uh, Ghana and uh, Professor Babu? Well, I've not seen them, but I'm not surprised. <clears throat> you know, all the religious artifacts, not all, maybe <laughs> I would say 90% of the religious artifacts sold in Dakar are made in China, including Quranic verses, for example, Ayat al-Kursi. All That's of those things are made. Pictures of caliphs and, 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 and sons of saints are made in China. So I'm not surprised that they came up with a new vision of mm-hmm. Mandi Arabuso. <clears throat> Very interesting. Uh, there's another question here for Professor Babu. How can Murid migration studies uh, enhance our understanding of migration studies and Islamic studies more generally? And how can these kind of studies improve our understanding or representations of African societies uh, in historical perspective? Yeah. I think uh, what really we can learn from uh, Murid immigrants and immigrants of that sort is it really help us unpack the politics of globalizations. I call all these migrants and all this diaspora as interlopers. These are people for whom globalization was not made. They were not in the picture when all these ideas of circulation of money and circulation of, of uh, uh, de- uh, uh, skills actually were designed by neoliberal economists. That was not the purpose of it. So what really that, that teaches us is that they can help us unpack this politics of globalization. And as my colleague uh, 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 Mahmoud Juf write about, to see this kind of vernacular cosmopolite that travel all over the world, take advantage of opportunities and use their opportun- these opportunities for their own sake in their own way, in a way not imagined really by the architect of globalization and the architects of uh, 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 neoliberalism. I think the other thing that to me is important, uh, particularly I care about it a lot, is that the scholarship on migration tends to focus too much on narrow economic issues. That's right. You know, uh, the push-pull mm-hmm. theories, supply and demand, you know, mm-hmm. labor force, all of, all of that. And what is lost in translation there is the human being themselves and their feelings and their culture and their sentiments. Mm-hmm. These are not only a bunch of muscles That's that right. do job to get money. These are people also that come with ideas and belief. And these are people who try to insert themselves in this global marketplace of ideas and culture. And what is interesting here is this kind of research bring that picture to the fore. It really enrich the scholarship by really kind of highlighting this dimension of globalization that are lost in the focus, the narrow focus on politics and economics. That's really what I see as as enriching. And of course, something that Fallu touched uh, earlier on is what, how creative these people are and how resourceful they are. Uh, the Murid I study, for example, the first generation, those who arrived in the 1980s, 
They never went to French school. For most of them, this was their first time to fly a plane. Some of them arrive here with $20 in New York City. Uh, I would be lost <laughs> if it were me. <laughs> you know, I would be completely lost. But these people who maybe step migrated to Dakar, stay there for a few for a few months or a few years, work at the market of Sandaga, became so literate in debris, in making things happen, in creating a life anywhere, that actually in the largest metropolis, metropolises of the, of the world, they were able to make a place for themselves. And I think this will teach us something about, um, you know, how we look at things, you know, uh, how we look at people and what we value. And sometimes the mistake we make by putting Western education at a pedestal where it is not actually. And sometimes ignoring all these people that did not have a Western education are not urbanized, are not felt thought of as sophisticated. How these people can be extremely resourceful and extremely creative by creating their own space and by being successful uh, in the Western world and even shaping the economy. I mean, the economy, Harlem, clearly to Senegal, was a major factor in reviving Harlem uh, in the 1990s and in the early 20s. So this is this is something that I think is, is quite helpful for a scholar of migration. Well, that's, that's a good point. And I think that uh, Ghana has probably something to say on that human dimension that um, Professor Barber touched on. And so Ghana, could you talk about how uh, these migrants are deploying uh, Islamic ethics that they learned from home to portray themselves as uh, good people, good Muslim, uh, to both proselytize and earn a living? Um, yeah, um, that's a, an, an interesting debate. And I'm thinking, uh, as uh, Professor Babu was, uh, was talking, I was thinking about the, the work of, of, of Jacqueline Agen and um, uh, Hernandez Leon on Mexican migrants. The book is called Skills of the Unskilled, Work, Mobility, and um, Among Mexican Migrants. And the work, of course, is based in North Carolina, but I think that it's a debate that kind of touches upon um, many aspects of, of migrants all around the world, that this focus on economic migrants kind of obscures as an as a, as a important aspect, not just important aspect for us as researchers, but important for the migrants themselves. And in, this is in, in this respect that I'm going to answer your question of, regarding Senegalese immigrants, for example, in Brazil. If you pay attention to the language they use in order to talk about themselves, you would notice one thing. First of all, they say they are, they are in a mission. Naka missionbi. When they greet each other, they say naka missionbi. That is, you are there to do something, not just money, but they are also there to show a positive image of, 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 of Islam in a, in a post-9-11 context. How do they do that? You have to show that you are an ethical subject in your everyday life. When doing business, you're not supposed to be cheating, etc., etc., um, when you do a um, an economic transaction and there is an extra money, you have to make sure you find that person and return the money. And Senegalese have made headlines in Brazil of many times because of such such small acts of 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 of, of honesty. But of course, that are seen as important because people think that the migrants who are coming here are just after money, right? One other thing is also that when those happen and the media kind of gives them the floor. What they stress is that we are here to earn a decent living, but we are also here to live an ethical life. We are Muslims. We are, we are Muslims. We are Murids. We are not supposed to do this. And this sort of preoccupation with ethics, this preoccupation with earning a decent, an honest living in Brazil um, contrasts with some of the things that the media would say, for example, starting or politicians, starting with Bolsonaro, who says that the scum of the world is making its way to, to, to Brazil and naming Senegalese in part for, as, as part of that scum that is, that is making its way to, to, to Brazil. All of that to say that really, um, I think that it's, it's important to pay attention to what migrants are themselves saying about their migratory projects, rather than just focusing on you know, how many people are coming in and what are they doing, rather than saying what are they saying about their own um, situations. And uh, I have one follow-up question for, to uh, Professor uh, Babu. So the making of uh, Muri spaces wherever they go 
Kirisir in Tuba everywhere. Do you think that this might be the direct result of Muri proselytizing since the teachings of uh, Amadou Bamba, no, no the, the teachings of his supporters, uh, the Wall of Al-Kat, by Jahate Morkaire? Because you see in the Ajami literature, they say, you know, wherever he went, that place acquires sanctity. Do you think that it is, it is those narratives that sanctified all the places where, but that Bamba visited locally that are reinforced in uh, this Ajami uh, poetry uh, disseminated among the masses? Do you think that is actually what is being used as a framework overseas? Yeah, I think it, it, it's part of a global phenomenon um, of uh, surviving no matter what uh, and uh, um, making the mission succeed uh, no matter what obstacles you have to overcome because you are in the right and you have God with you. I think it, it goes back to the migration. It goes back to Gabon. It goes back to the migration to Mauritania. It goes back to the migration around Senegal. And to what Amadou Bamba said to the colonial administration very clearly, well, I'm not in competition with you. I'm not looking for bodies. I'm looking for souls. Yeah. I don't want to conquer people. I don't want to rule people. But I have a mission that the prophet confided on me. It's teaching. I will do it. That's that's what I will do. I will do it. And I will do it in whatever circumstances actually God created for me. And, and that we saw very clearly, very early on in the process of migration among the Murid. And of course, those narratives you're talking about are very are, are at the heart of it. Those narratives, because what they do is, since Amadou Bamba wrote mostly, uh, almost, on in, in Arabic script, then those sheikh who are actually literate in Arabic, but decided to write in Wolof, mm. they saw it as their duty too to do that, yeah. to make sure that Amadou Bamba thinking and project and ideas can migrate too. That's good, yeah. This is a kind of mental migration, or That's you right. might call I, it I, I, an intellectual like migration of the project. I, I like that, intellectual migration. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really an intellectual migration yeah. of the project, but how can you do it? You do it through language. You do it by speaking to people in a language they can understand, but also, it's not only language, it's not only the sound they hear, but also what is behind those sounds, what they represent, the kind of what is signified, really. Not the signifier only, but what is signified. Meaning, really, as your, your, your research has magnificently done, really digging deep in all of culture, all of symbolism, all of notion of space and ethics and values to translate what is in classical Arabic into all of and, and make it really part of people's blood in people's flesh. And that's exactly all the whole of the, the whole thing, really the holistic kind of approach of all of these things allow us to understand why the Muridi is so resilient, not only by overcoming colonial oppression, but even in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what is remarkable is all these people I study, they will tell you, hey, we have no problem walking out in Paris dressed as Murid. We are very happy to do that. We are very happy to speak the kind of uh, language the purest Wolof, they would yeah. say, mm -hmm. you know, we're not we're not afraid to be called ball ball, you know, yeah. uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, crazy people. We're really uh, 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 happy to do that. These people don't have superior inferiority complex. In yeah. fact, they have superiority complex, <laughs> which is yeah. quite, quite interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's very interesting. So I have one follow-up question for Professor Wheeler. So you mentioned the teaching within the Nation of Islam that emphasizes. Uh, creating your own heaven on earth. Mm -hmm. So I know in the Sufi tradition, especially talking about the Buddhists that I know better, there's always the, this dual notion of the dual paradise. So paradise in this world as, as a prelude for paradise in the afterlife. So the Buddhists like to live. They like to be successful here because successful here is one of the measures of success over there. <laughs> So I wonder whether in um, this uh, uh, notion of uh, creating your own heaven on earth here, is that the same understanding that success on this earth, material success on this earth, is a prelude for uh, success in the afterlife in the nation of Islam thinking? Um, I don't think it is how it was originally imagined. I think the whole focus on heaven on earth was a critique of um, white supremacy 
um, and white capitalism in the United States. So it was this idea um, that you could not expect the U.S. government to support Black people. Um, and it was a critique of Christianity that Black Christianity that historically has told people like the more you suffer on earth, the higher your position will be in heaven. So we're just pushing back against that idea in general. Okay, I see. Uh, you touched on hairstyle too. And, and, and I think that was very interesting. I have uh, this one parallel. Uh, among the Muris, in, I can't remember when it was, maybe in 2000 or uh, the 1990s, there was, a, there was a competition of hairdo. And the one that won was the one, the woman who had the mosque of Tuba as a hairdo, as a, as a hairdo, and um, showing how uh, movements from the, the sacred to the secular is very, very common, right? And so, and, I, and, and that brings me to one larger question that I want to ask to all of you is the uh, general trend of the dichotomy between the written and the oral between the religious and the sacred, between the visible and the supernatural world. Based on your uh, fieldwork data, are these dichotomies, do they hold if you confront them to your data that you are collecting? Uh, and do we need to think about a continuum rather than mutually exclusive uh, uh, concepts, analytical concepts? Any of you? Let me, let me jump in. I think I, I partially replied to your question when I suggested the idea of the migration of, of ideas and concepts and, and practices, because all of, everything starts with Amadou Bamba's poetry, which of course is written, but then it migrates also through orality. Uh, and uh, after transiting through written text that's in right, Wolof. Right. And, and you know better than I do these things. And, and my sense is that written text is really is an oral text. It's not right. really scripture, it's right. oral text. Yeah. So you, you've got certainly the circulation. You have yeah. the circulation between the original text. Then you have uh, the transition through Wolof, uh, Wolofal, and then you go to orality. Again, this is a circulation here. And I think, you know, one of the things that I, 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 I try to explain uh, by looking at space making and so forth and, and by looking at... Uh, uh, at it through the angle of accumulation of experiences and all of that, it's really to, to, to try to explain how space can embody practices, symbols, iconography, and language, how space can embody all of that. So what we really have is kind of the circulation of different vehicles and media uh, for the same goal. That That's is, right. how do we turn a secular space into sacred space? Right. And how do we make uh, ordinary place ordinary space into extraordinary, extraordinary space. Yeah. And this is done through different media, yeah. not only one, but through many. Of course, yeah. uh, iconography, but also language, singing, songs, just yeah. say sacred words, but also images and other 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 things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, Professor Wheeler? I would say from my research, it's definitely show that the, my interlocutors destabilize these categories, um, these dichotomies, especially like the written and oral uh, members of the nation aren't just using the Quran, they're using the Bible. Um, they're using like books written by Elijah Muhammad. Um, members of the Wolfie Muhammad community are using that as well as the um, writings of Imam Wolfie Muhammad. So I think these constructs don't allow us to see how creative and innovative uh, African Muslims are and Black Muslims are. Um, and I think if you talk to them, they would at least my interlocutors would say, these are kind of like white people things, that this idea that the religious is just something you do in a masjid and then you come out in the streets and it's secular. They make the streets religious through their presence, through seeing these hijabs um, or Marie's walking down Harlem and Bobo's. Like they transform the space, even if it's just temporarily and they transform how other people interact with those spaces. All right. Ghana, you have something to add? Yeah, um, in my case, I would say that, um, for example, when most people talk about these uh, Senegalese immigrants in Brazil, they, they, they characterize them as uneducated just because they don't speak French. And, you know, and for that reason, it's harder for them to learn Portuguese um, academic, you know, from an academic perspective. But in fact, 
these young Senegalese who are coming to Brazil, most of them are graduates of the Daras. Or if they have not graduated from the Daras, they have kind of acquired an advanced level of, 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 of understanding of the Quran and, you know, of, of Arab and Arabic literacy. Now, when they get to Brazil, they need to continue that education. And this education is generally continued via social media. That you have somebody who is knowledgeable. They have, a, for example, a WhatsApp group called Hamsadine, where almost every day somebody who is knowledgeable about Islam and, you know, um, the Muridia will be the guest. And he will be in charge, for example, of providing an, an excerpt of Bamba's poetry, for example, and commenting on it. Sometimes some will put up, for example, a video um, of, a, of a given manuscript and, and explain it. And of course, social media sort of allows all those elements to merge. Orality, the written, the visual, everything is together, put together so as to help these young Muslims who are away from their original um, Quranic masters to continue their education. And of course, these also serve other purposes. I have seen many times manuscripts of um, some um, like talismanic manuscript, for example, saying that if you recite this, you know, in a day you will not die that day, etc. Or this <laughs> is, will help you, for example, you know, um, for, for your businesses, etc., etc. And that circulation, of course, it's difficult to, to separate the, the written and, 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 the, yes. and the oral. Well, I think uh, this is a wonderful panel and uh, we are now coming to the end. And uh, I just wanted to wrap up and first to thank you all for your wonderful insights and uh, the uh, lessons we've learned uh, uh, based on your research is uh, fresh and is clearly going to shape the way moving forward. I wanted to also emphasize the history of African Muslims in the Americas and their legacies uh, is a story that is both old and less understood. Uh, as some of you have touched on, educated and uneducated Africans have been present in various parts of the Americas before the emergence of present day nation, nation states. Enslaved Africans who were educated and acquired dual literacy skills in Arabic and African languages, which we just touched on in their homeland in Africa, have also produced important Arabic and Ajami texts. In South, in South Africa, recent research shows that the first records of Afrikaans was produced in Ajami by Muslim Malay slaves. Mm -hmm. African slaves in Rio de Janeiro and Bahia in Brazil, Jamaica, Peru, Belize, Guyana, Bahamas, Trinidad, Haiti, and Maryland have also produced important archives that remain largely unstudied. These include Ayub Suleiman Jallo of Maryland, Umar Ibn Said, who spent the last part of his life in North Carolina, Lamin Kaba of Georgia, who reported having studied under both male and female teachers in his native land of Futa Jalon, and Bilal of the Sapelo Islands of the coast of Georgia, who served as a leader of the African Muslims there. And as you know, all of you I'm sure are familiar with the story of Abu Bakr as Siddiqui, uh, who kept the account of his employer in English, Ajami, English spelled with Arabic script. Uh, so such archives written by enslaved Africans are scattered throughout the Americas, but remain largely unacknowledged. I think it's important that in order to decolonize African studies, we should begin to acknowledge these important written archives and go beyond the overemphasis on oral traditions of Africa to have more direct access to African knowledge systems in their own words. This obviously will require a lot of work. It will require many of us to retool and invest in learning African languages and scripts in order to incorporate African perspectives in their works by, by breaking the cycle of epistemological dependencies on Eurocentric approaches to study Africa and overcoming what I have called the linguistic paradox in academia, which, which does not require knowledge of African languages in the training of African scholars, African scholars, but we require those who are studying Latin America to learn uh, Spanish 
or those who are studying America to learn Spanish, uh, to learn English, and those who are studying French to learn French. But those who are studying Africa are asked to learn uh, uh, French or English when they may be working in a Wolof or Swahili or Hausa speaking area. I think this is one of probably our biggest challenge that we have to face as scholars in the way we train the next generation of scholars. So this has to change if African studies is to be truly reflective of African voices and be more accurate in the 21st century. So I wanna really thank all of you for your participation in this uh, wonderful panel. And uh, to say that we're all very grateful that you were able to make it and uh, to uh, teach us so much uh, today. Thank you.